The September 2015 issue of Jacket Inventions includes a mini focus on coronary physiology, and it's including papers looking at the perplexing issue of non-obstructive CAD that certainly seems to, in many cases, act like it's obstructive CAD. So we're looking at prevalence in this paper of coronary microvascular dysfunction among patients with chest pain and non-obstructive coronary artery disease. And I am with uh, Dr. Amir Lerman, who is a professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiovascular Disease at the Mayo College of Medicine. First off, thank you very much, because I was talking to Kim Eagle, and he was, he's, he's the editor of, of ACC.org, and he was telling me this is a really challenging group of, paper, of patients. So why did you do this study to begin with? Well, that's a good, good. First of all, thanks for the opportunity to, to, to talk with you about this subject. Well, we, we actually uh, know, and I think there's several important points, that about 30, depends on the uh, institution, about 30, almost 30 to 40 percent of the patients presenting uh, to the cardiac catheterization laboratory are not found to have any significant obstructive disease. Right. Well, one of the issues is that uh, the co current practice, if they're not uh, scheduled to have any intervention, uh, we're not providing any solution for them. And they are continuing to have symptoms. Uh, they continue to consume resources of medical health, so re can repeat coronary angiogram and repeat right. the uh, presentation to uh, emergency room. And so we at Mayo for the last 20 years focusing on this population that our majority of them are women that are presenting with symptoms, uh, abnormalities uh, on exercise tests, signs of ischemia, and about 50% of them present already with some evidence of uh, uh, troponic elevation and some uh, significant myocardial damage. Now, there are various ways to define it. So how did you define non-obstructive coronary disease? So non-obstructive coronary disease in our hand is uh, less than 30 to 40% disease by angiography on any vessel. So if a patient have any significant disease in one of the vessels, this patient is excluded. Okay. So what we call mild to mild, mild, mild atherosclerosis by angiography. So describe the design of this study, okay. which was very interesting. So the design of the study is, is based on the fact that uh, the microcirculation is actually regulating myocardial blood flow and perfusion. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't see this microcirculation in geography, and the only way to assess is to assess the function of the microcirculation. We believe, based on data, that the microcirculation is uh, being uh, assessed by, can, should be assessed by two major underlying mechanisms. The non-endothelium-dependent vasodilation, which is, can assess by adenosine, and the endothelium-dependent vasodilation that should be assessed by giving acetylcholine. Uh, at Mayo, this is a clinical practice protocol, and we actually uh, use it as our, to assess our patient for the last 20 years. And the major goal is that when you take, when you take patient, you don't take patient off the table without providing a clear diagnosis why the patient arrived. And so in this uh, uh, study, we actually look at the microcirculation function using uh, Doppler wire and to see the response of coronary blood flow to chemical stimuli that actually uh, are, in a sense, what we see in real life, like response to exercise or mental stress or even rest chest pain. So it provides us a means to assess what's the microcirculation function in this patient and what's the mechanism, potential mechanism for their symptoms or ischemia in this patient. Now, what did you find? Because I was kind of surprised by some of the, yeah. the findings in this trial. So the major finding is that the majority of them, close to 64% of them, has abnormality, have abnormalities in the microcirculation, which means that in this patient that we actually are doing a diagnostic angiogram and do not have angiographic obstructive disease, do have abnormalities that can explain their chest pain, their ischemia, and their troponic elevation. So majority of them. 65% uh, or 66% in women and 63 also in men have abnormalities in the microcirculation. I was surprised that female sex had only a trend towards an association with abnormal microvascular function compared to men. Did that surprise you? Well, yes and no. You know, I think that women tend more to present with uh, myocardial infarction with uh, not obstructive disease. But uh, uh, we find out that men also can present it. So it's true that women has more prevalence of maybe microvascular dysfunction, but it's not exclude, excluding uh, the same phenomenon in men. So diagnostic coronary angiography alone may underdiagnose the potential mechanisms responsible for chest pain is the, the kind of the message here. Yeah. The message is that diagnostic angiogram is a very poor test to detect uh, source of ischemia. It's a good test for obstructive disease. It's a good test to decide if intervention needs to be done. But if there is no significant disease, um, I think that the assessment of the microcirculation should be done 
in order to give the patient a full report or full assessment uh, when the patient leaves the cat lab. Since you've been looking at this for a period of time, what kind of mechanisms of microvascular dysfunction are you proposing? So that, that's an excellent question. Uh, uh, initially, the thought about the microvascular dysfunction is a uh, relationship to, uh, to conventional risk factors. We found out that conventional risk factors present, but not necessarily correlate. So I think the, the uh, more mechanistic of uh, oxidative stress, inflammation, or other unrecognized risk factors, such as uh, ongoing inflammation, sleep apnea, thing, mental stress, um, may be common in this patient and should be explored. We know that this, the presence of microvascular dysfunction is actually um, diagnosed uh, the risk for 23% of the patient that only undergoing diagnostic. So we add risk assessment by almost one to every four patients, it adds a risk assessment. How did these abnormalities correlate with conventional cardiovascular risk factors? Not very well, not very well. So they don't correlate very well with the conventional risk factors. They do not correlate with very well with also non-invasive stress tests. So the message is that you cannot do that. You cannot by Framingham score or by, uh, right. you, you can understand that this is patient may be a little bit of a higher risk, but you cannot say that this patient have or does not have endothelial microvascular dysfunction. So out of the whole paper, what surprised you the most? Anything? Well, as you said, the, the high prevalence of uh, microvascular disease in men uh, was, was a little bit surprising, but uh, this is the second time we actually see this phenomenon, that it exists in a little bit of old age. So the average age of presentation in men is five years older than women. So it exists, but it's a little bit an older population, and maybe age is playing a major role and factor in this one. Well, this is a really interesting issue of, of Jack interventions for a variety of reasons, and not the least of which is this mini focus on co coronary physiology. It's the September Jack interventions. Please look for this paper and others related. For Cardiosource World News, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.